All right, it's 2.45, so let's start. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining. Today is the last day of the, of the IGF. I think uh, some of us might feel very tired. On the other hand, some of us feel like, oh, it's already over. Um, so my name is Jerong. I work for ICANN. I'm the head of the Asia Pacific office. I'm based in Singapore. And today's session is on multilingual internet, a key catalyst for access and inclusion. So with me, uh, we have two on-site speakers and three speakers speaking remotely, so I'll introduce them. So on my right is Mr. Edmund Chung. He's our board member from ICANN and also CEO of Dot Asia. And on my left is Ms. Teresa Swinehart, our Senior Vice President for Global Domains and Strategy from ICANN. And joining remotely, we have Dr. Marielza Oliveira. She's the Director for the Division for Digital Inclusion Policies and Transformation Communications and Information Sector from UNESCO. And also Ms. Nodumo Velamini, the Director for ICT Services and Knowledge Management, the Association of African Universities. And also, last but not least, Mr. Mark Durden. He's the Key Project Manager from SIL International. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me, um, my esteemed speakers, and also our participants for today. Now, let's dive in. We only have an hour uh, with a pretty interesting topic. So can I invite Edmund to first help us frame the issue of uh, multilingual internet? Uh, Edmund, can you share about language? Do you think it is a barrier to access? And at a high level, talk about you know, what are some gaps or problems, uh, particularly pertaining to uh, access, uh, such as you know, internationalized domain names, which is using domain names in local scripts as well as you know, the uh, related issues of adopting internationalized domain names. And uh, a broader question to this perhaps is at a high level, do you think this is a policy problem, a technical problem, or a social economic problem, or all of them? Over to you, please, Edmund. Thank you, Jarong. Anything we discuss here is all of them right, <laughs> at IGF. Um, but uh, I guess, um, as, as Jaron mentioned, to, to ask me to, to start by framing the, the, the question, um, it's really, I think the title today uh, is, uh, is really important. And I will start by saying that a fully multilingual internet really is the, the foundation towards digital inclusion. And, and, and that's, you know, I think that's very important. And if you look at uh, the world, there are over 6,500 languages you know, around the world, many of them, uh, over 2,000 of them actually here uh, in Asia where we are. And, um, and yet, today on, on the web, almost 60% of the internet's content is still in English. So, so really a, a multilingual internet, I, I believe, is essential is for digital inclusion because the next billion who's coming online do not have English as their first language, and um, and that's you know that's the that's the issue we have. That's the the topic we're talking about, um, and the kind of the the doorway to 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 access uh, information, and also the the key, one of the key um, uh, kind of a, a starting point for for people utilizing the internet is. Our domain names and uh, email addresses. So, really, um, having internationalized uh, email, uh, e internationalized domain names and internationalized email addresses is a, a, a foundation for um, development of content and services in local languages. So, in in that you know. It, Taken in that context and in, in the digital inclusion context, we really see that we, we can really see that universal acceptance of international uh, internationalized domain names and email addresses is really about language justice. It is about marginalized language communities impacted by language barriers. And here we're talking about people, you know, accessing the internet um, uh, and also. Uh, as a beginning of accessing 
information on the internet uh, in their local language. Again, you know, domain names and email addresses is maybe a very small part of it, but without which the multilingual internet is not complete. Um, and speaking of uh, language justice, I think uh, the next speaker will talk more about it, but um, I think put it in perspective of, uh, of the UN, um, we are in the international decade of indigenous languages. Um, and that's, that's an important uh, way to frame this, this question as well. And I'm seeing in, in, the, um, in the audience, uh, uh, my friend Yudo there, that talked to me about uh, having the Java uh, Java, uh, Javanese language to be expressed uh, on the internet and in internationalized domain names. These are some of the things because um, I think th this is uh, 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 what we we're talking about. And the ICANN community, um, I think we have been working very hard for many years, working through these technical standards, the linguistic and script policies that, that to ensure uh, secure and stable uh, uh, introduction of internationalized domain names on the DNS. But can we do more? The, the answer is, of course, yes, we do need to do more. And yes, we, we can do more. Today, there are uh, about 1,500 top-level domains uh, in, on, on the internet, and only 10% is actually using other, you know, different lang uh, other languages other than the uh, alphanumeric A to Z 0 to 9. Uh, actually, no 0 to 9, sorry I, about that. Top-level domains don't <laughs> include numbers, but the point is only 10% uh, are uh, internationalized domain names, and out of the 350 million domain names registered worldwide, only 1%, only about 1% is internationalized domain names. So registries and registrars do need to, to work harder to ensure their systems are fully universal acceptance and IDN ready. Um, and, and this is also even for non-IDN uh, related, non, uh, so, so even for registries and registrars not offering uh, internationalized domain name services, it's important for their systems to be ready for internationalized domain names and email addresses because your registrant, even if they're registering an English domain name, could be using an internationalized email address, right? I mean, that's what we are talking about in terms of universal acceptance. So it is a technical implementation issue, back to Jaron's question. Um, but it will require policy intervention. Uh, I believe you know, governments need to, to demand uh, in their tenders for IT systems, for example, that, uh, that systems be uh, IDN uh, email uh, ready. Um, schools and universities should include internationalized uh, domain names and email addresses as basic protocols for networking 101, for example. And we need other stakeholders to, to join in the work. Um, and that's why you know, we, we need to talk about it here at the IGF, um, because we need a movement. And this movement for, for language justice is, is really uh, uh, you know, starts here in, in the internet governance community. So um, I guess I'll, uh, uh, I, 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 you know, and finally, I wanted to just, just note that, of course, just the uh, internationalized domain names and email address themselves does not solve the multilingual internet issue. Of course not. I mean, it, it, but it is a foundation, foundational component because without which we, we cannot realize a fully multilingual internet. And you know, um, this is a, this this will require a multi-stakeholder approach to address um, the different issues that is beyond uh, ICANN and, and the immediate community's uh, 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 reach in, in many ways. And the key aspect, I believe, is to really get the, the end users and the community to realize that this is not just a matter of convenience or, 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 or cool domain names and email addresses, but it is about um, realizing a sustainable multilingual internet that cares about uh, language justice. Thank you, Adnan. I really like the key word about language justice. And here at the IGF, I remember there was a side event I attended uh, on the soft launch of a uh, network for social justice and digital resilience. And I think, you know, just tying in one of those themes, uh, really having a multilingual internet, uh, being about language justice is also a form of social justice. 
Um, now, let's move on quickly to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Marielza. Uh, so, Marielza is from the UNESCO, and uh, can you share about the background of multilingualism at the UN? Uh, and where are we today? You know, are there any recent multilingualism initiatives by the UN or UNESCO? Over to you, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, the particularly our dear ICANN colleagues with whom the UNESCO team has been working to advance multilingualism in cyberspace. Uh, uh, well, I'm really happy to join this session today as this is a very important topic to me. And I apologize that I'll have to leave soon to another commitment, but, um, but let me share some, some thoughts with you. You know, first, um, when, when I, I love that uh, the previous uh, speaker was talking about uh, language justice, because this is really about realizing a human right to freedom of expression and access to information. You know, so you, you can't really, you know, share your thoughts or seek information if you don't really, you know, uh, cannot do it, uh, um, in, in your own language. And uh, since its invention, the internet has been acknowledged as a really powerful tool for societal progress, a source of information, a means to exchange products and services, but it has also been recognized to have the ability to empower individuals, you know, uh, particularly granting them, you know, uh, enabling and, and upholding the, the rights to access to information, expression, and so on, while simultaneously amplifying the voices of marginalized groups. Uh, however, you know, we must accept the current reality is that an estimated 37% of the world population or close to 2.7 billion people are still not taking advantage of the internet's transformative power. And this means you know, that there is a barrier that separates a large part of humanity from the pool of knowledge in the form of digital resources. And as more and more services are going digital, as noted by the UN Secretary General's recent report, <clears throat> sorry, we are faced with, <clears throat> sorry, we are faced with the pressing challenge of connecting the next one billion users to really benefit from the digital processes, and that means that we must up the ante in providing digital services to the indigenous and underserved communities that have struggled for a long time with limited access and representation in the digital sphere. And the lack of multilingualism in cyberspace is an essential aspect of achieving, you know, uh, 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 of this uh, uh, part of big barrier of ach for achieving digital inclusion. And in 2003, the UNESCO General Conference adopted the recommendation concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and universal access to cyberspace. It is a landmark provision, and the recommendation provides a framework, <clears throat> sorry, for the member states to adopt legislation and other measures that are conducive to the promotion of multilingualism in digital ecosystems. And this includes forging new partnerships, facilitating mechanisms for multilingual domain names and associated tools, content, and process. And UNESCO and ICANN have a long-standing partnership on this front. And even this session has been you know, proposed uh, uh, on our collective understanding that the technology deployed still has to catch up to this progress to allow for digital inclusion for the multilingual communities globally. It's, it's, it is our collective responsibility to ensure that not only new technologies have to be innovated, but the communities must have to be brought closer to the ongoing digital transformation. And this has been, uh, can be done only if we address the glaring deficiency uh, uh, of uh, linguistic uh, diversity on the internet. And, um, and so one, as one of the co-leaders in the implementation of the International Decade of Indigenous Languages yeah, that goes from 2022 to 2032, UNESCO is playing a pivotal role in, this, in championing the preservation, promotion, and revitalization of Indigenous languages worldwide. There is a global action plan which highlights the importance of fostering favorable conditions for digital empowerment, freedom of expression, media development, access to information, and language technology. And this is where ICANN and UNESCO have been working together to bring synergy uh, uh, to their efforts. Collectively, we must really prioritize making internet platforms and applications accessible to people with diverse linguistic abilities and, and thus ensure really universal participation and inclusion. And here, uh, let me just say that uh, 
The interplay between languages and universal acceptance is complex and multifaceted, while achieving universal acceptance of languages is unquestionably essential, like a, you know, the previous speaker mentioned, a foundation. We must also focus on the creation of digital tools, products, and services uh, tailored specifically to the needs of uh, underserved communities and currently unserved communities. And it's incumbent upon UNESCO and ICANN to advocate for a broader conception, one that encompasses the notion of universal inclusion and remedies, uh, this deficiency in internet uh, uh, linguistic diversity. And so, you know, uh, I'd like to say to all our participants today, you know, I urge all of us, you know, to maintain a real awareness of the internet's immense potential as a tool for positive transformation and for us to work together to unify, innovate, and advocate for multilingualism and universal inclusion. So I hope that we all be working together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Elza. So we've heard a couple of uh, technical terms in some ways. So internationalized domain names, which are domain names in different scripts beyond the, uh, the English alphabet. And also the term universal acceptance, which is uh, in software and applications uh, to universally accept these domain names and email addresses in other scripts. Now, let's move on very quickly to Teresa. Uh, Teresa, can you share about ICANN's work? Just now, Maria Elza just mentioned, you know, UNESCO and ICANN are in close co collaboration. But can you share uh, more specifically about ICANN, like ICANN's work in relation to internationalized domain names and uh, universal acceptance? Please. Brilliant. Uh, first of all, it's it's great to be here um, and and to be having this conversation. I think, as Edmund said, we need a movement, and we need awareness. Um, with the amount of languages spoken in all the different regions of the world that are not uh, reflected in ASCII character sets, or perhaps have um, a longer variation to the right of the dot, we need to afford the ability for those to be used uh, for really to have a fully inclusive internet. So ICANN has a limited remit with regards to our responsibilities, but we play a strong role in this and partner with others. Uh, a couple areas, how, how it's anchored uh, within uh, the construct of the mission. Uh, the IDN work, or internationalized domain name and universal acceptance, is uh, recognized both in uh, the strategic focus and it's included in our strategic plan. Uh, our strategic plan, uh, and the reason this is important, is developed with community input uh, and really looking towards what the future is. Uh, it's based on the analysis of uh, trends and where the future goes. Uh, that's compiled and then um, brought to the board, and the board looks at what the final strategic plan is, uh, but also puts it out for awareness to the community. So it's really an all-inclusive process as we do this. Uh, so the fact that um, IDNs and universal acceptance are um, anchored within the strategic plan for the 21 uh, to 25 uh, is an important factor, and we anticipate it to be reflected likewise in the next iteration. Uh, importantly, it's also an element that's uh, reflected in um, our interim CEO's goals uh, very strongly. Uh, so again, important to show that we are, are taking this work uh, that we're doing uh, seriously, uh, but also uh, that this is really what the future is about, and that's important for ICANN's mission and mandate uh, in serving the public interest. Uh, so if we look at what we're doing uh, more specifically, uh, within, uh, with regards to internationalized domain names, there's a couple areas. More on the operational technical side, um, they're working on tables to make sure that if it's registered, it's following a certain table uh, and making sure that those tables are compiled. If we look at the policy side, there's work within the generic name supporting organization with regards to policies for internationalized domain names uh, in the generic name space, that is to the right of the dot. Uh, and within the country code supporting organization, there is further work on what was a policy to enable initial uh, country code top-level domains to be uh, accepted in IDNs. There's further work on that uh, to ensure that there's policies for the future around that. 
so the reason the generic space is different is because it uh, applies to the generic top-level domains uh, at the country level, the CCTLDs uh, for the country top-level domains. Uh, so there's quite a bit of policy work there. We also have a team that very specifically is going out to the community and working with them on both the table work, how to create awareness, how to look at this from a technical level, how to ensure trainings around that. Uh, so we partner with different groups in different regions and around the world. Uh, if we look at universal acceptance, likewise very active in that area. Uh, again, within our mandate, we work uh, very well with the what's referred to the UASG, so the Universal, Universal Acceptance Steering Group, which is a group that has been active in this space, but also working with UNESCO, working with other organizations around the importance of the ability for platforms uh, and for the ability of email or web, uh, web um, addresses to be able to resolve so that you know that they actually go there. And again, we're working uh, on the technical side on helping with trainings, participating in partnership with others uh, to help uh, awareness about both the issue but help uh, also problem solve on the, on the technical level. On universal acceptance, um, in addition, uh, last year was the first uh, universal acceptance day uh, in which more than uh, 50 events uh, across 40 countries uh, brought awareness around the importance of universal acceptance. That was attended by about 9,500 people. Uh, but if you look at the ripple effect of that and the shared experience plus the uh, awareness in the media around it, it was a start. Uh, we're looking forward to holding the next Universal Acceptance Day in 2024. Uh, and with that, looking forward to partnering with other organizations and platform providers uh, in order to create a movement and create awareness around things. Uh, and uh, we don't do any of this alone. We can't, we have a limited remit in this, um, but we are one of the elements uh, to that and to partner with others. And finally, uh, if I can just touch on uh, the next round of the introduction of new top level domains. So when we open up that opportunity uh, for the introduction of those, uh, looking very much at um, uh, ensuring that those who wish to register a name in internationalized uh, domain name character sets, so something that is not ASCII, uh, or something that might require uh, ensuring universal acceptance but in ASCII character sets, uh, we're doing quite a bit of awareness building around that uh, in, uh, in cooperation with the fact that we will be opening another round. And that round could afford the opportunity for all language groups or different regions of the world that currently do not have a presence, so to speak, but would like one uh, to have that opportunity to do it, but also that technically uh, it will then also resolve in the system. Uh, so those are just a few examples of some key work areas uh, and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Theresa. <coughs> so let's hold on to the, the piece about the UA Day because I think that it ties in with what this, uh, so far all the speakers are saying, uh, a movement, like a call to action. I feel that's something we can really work on at this session. So let's move on to the other speakers first. Let's go to Mark. So Mark uh, is more of a, a, from your background, you're more of a technical person. So I'll ask a more technical question. So what technical qu uh, issues in your experience are you seeing in relation to internationalized domain names and uh, universal acceptance adoption. Mark, over to you, please. Uh, thank you, Jirong, for your question. And um, thank you for the invitation to join this panel. I'm quite excited by the goals of universal acceptance, not least because um, my organization, uh, SIL International, works primarily with indigenous and ethnic minority communities uh, around a thousand different communities around the world. And so this is very important for the communities that we're working with. It's essential to their engagement uh, with the online world, with the rest of the world. So I'd like to share a story, first of all, about my experience just this year with uh, internationalized email addresses. So a little earlier this year, I downloaded the uh, 2022 Universal Acceptance Readiness Report in PDF file. And in that report, I read that only 10% of email systems currently meet the needs of universal acceptance. So out of curiosity, 
I clicked on the Thai email address example in the PDF just to try it out. And if you want to try it, it's on page 11 of that report. And Gmail popped up its compose window, uh, but it had a completely garbled uh, like Mojibaki email address in its to field, uh, which meant that that just wasn't going to work. So I wasn't going to give up that quickly, I right clicked on the email address in the PDF and copied it to my clipboard and pasted it into Gmail and no, still didn't work. All I got was a string of dots with an at sign in the middle. So finally, I actually selected the text of the email address in the PDF file with my mouse and I copied that to the clipboard and I was able to paste it into Gmail and try it out. Uh, but that still didn't work because it turns out that the mail host for my personal domain does not yet support the SMTP UTF-8 mail protocol, and so the test email bounced. Now, I did eventually get it working by sending it from my Gmail address, but I'm supposed to be some sort of expert in the area, and if I can't get it working without trying that hard, um, I think our community of users worldwide are going to have a very poor experience. So we really do have a long way to go. And in some areas, the computer industry moves very quickly, but some of these things seem to take a very long time. And I really don't think that the community can afford to wait for us. So I'll just switch tracks just a little bit now and talk about two specific areas that are close to my heart and how they overlap with universal acceptance. And that is uh, online security and input methods. So all the way back in 2016, I came across the labeled generation rules for the Khmer language of Cambodia. And I was really impressed at the level of detail and effort that had gone into um, trying to prepare these rules to make safe domain names in the Khmer script. Now, I've been working with Khmer input methods, and um, there was obviously so much detail about spoofing attacks that would be possible in Khmer uh, in those that would been covered off in those label generation rules. And I'm going to use Khmer for most of the rest of my examples because that's where I have the most experience. But a lot of these same principles apply to many writing systems across Asia and the world. Now, even for the Khmer script, it's more than just the Khmer language. This is the international decade of indigenous languages, um, as uh, Marielle has pointed out in her chat comment. Um, and we need to be thinking about all the language communities that use a particular script. Now for Latin script, it's uh, many, many languages and it's fairly well known. But even the Khmer script is used by at least eight different languages in Cambodia today. So as an industry, we need to put much more effort towards supporting those indigenous languages all around the world. And for example, and I'm not criticizing the, the label generation rules group here, that, but the Khmer label generation rules do not yet support most of the indigenous languages of Cambodia because the rules that they've defined are too constrained to support the ways that those languages are working with the script. It's a huge space with fuzzy boundaries, so we still need more dedicated effort to expand and support those languages. It was also personally disappointing to me when I found out that label generation rules have not been adopted by many major top level domain registries, including most visibly .com. So to prove this to myself, I registered a spoofed ChmerScript.com domain and tested it out. And yeah, I still got that domain in my collection of useless domains. So wide adoption of those label generation rules is so important for the uptake of internationalized domain names. Many Asian scripts are vastly more complex to type and encode than Latin script, and there are myriad opportunities for spoofing attacks. So I think we've many of us have seen those uh, alternate script examples like apple.com written with Cyrillic letters. Mixing scripts is one thing, but in many Asian scripts, we don't even need to mix the scripts to see these problems. For example, and again in the Khmer script, we've identified example words that can be encoded in up to 15 different ways in Unicode, but they look visually identical on all devices. And what's worse, we found real examples where Khmer users had typed those example words into web pages in every single one of those wrong encodings. And sometimes the incorrect encodings had more matches than the correct encodings. Now, smart input methods can help with this. So for Khmer, my team have introduced a Khmer Encore keyboard 
that's powered by the software that we write that automatically corrects the vast majority of those missing codings. This helps not just with preventing spoofing, but with any text task, searching, sorting, and so on. I'd like to say a big thank you to all of those who have contributed so far uh, to universal acceptance and for all the progress we have seen, and particularly the IDNs that are starting to, to take root in, in many places. But I'd also like to encourage the, the rest of the computing industry to, to just slow down a little bit and, and listen to the universal acceptance st steering group and start supporting the recommendations that have already been made. Thank you, Mark. Um, so there are some technical areas uh, which are important, but I think a key takeaway also is the key term of wide adoption. Um, so, you know, for the industry, I think Mark made a very good point, you know, we're sometimes chasing the next big thing and then sometimes forgetting uh, the people we're leaving behind. And I think this is a good segue to go to Nodumo because coming from an underserved region like uh, Africa, do you think internationalized domain names um, and its adoption would help break the language barrier for access and, um, and or help to preserve languages? I'll do more over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for having me on this panel. Yes, Africa is an underserved region for many reasons that include uh, unequal access to technology, unequal access to the internet and information resources. Um, yes, internationalized domain names can assist to break the language barrier for internet access uh, for, for the reasons that the various speakers have also alluded to, mostly because they facilitate accessibility in native language scripts, inclusivity, cultural and linguistic preservation, and also because they could facilitate the creation and dissemination of local content in our various languages. And I think that uh, users would also find it more fulfilling to go to the internet and use their own languages. Uh, I also acknowledge the challenges that have been alluded to by the speakers before me concerning IDNs, especially technical compatibility and that our systems are not yet all ready. The security concerns that have been mentioned by the previous speaker. And uh, I think uh, user education is also a major issue. In, in terms of the proper use of IDNs and also addressing the security risks associated with the international domain names. Um, of course, the, there's a need to create uh, awareness so that uh, we generate the needed demand for uptake of the IDNs and universal acceptance. And I think uh, awareness raising will be a very important aspect of what we need to, to prioritize uh, so that more people can understand what is possible. And uh, we, we also need to look at this, not just doing uh, awareness raising, but go a little further to, to do it as a package or as a broader strategy that will also address technical improvements and also address the issue of tools, user-friendly tools that can be adopted to encourage the adoption of uh, internationalized domain names. And we need to work together. We need to work with industry. We need to collaborate as internet stakeholders 
so that we can really generate awareness and also uh, adoption. And the issue of local content is, is also very pivotal and important for the success of IDMs because people are likely to adopt them if there's content available in their language. And uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, implementing robust security measures to protect users from phishing and domain speaking is also extremely uh, important. Uh, concerning how we can effectively reach the grassroots and specific language communities which are not yet online, I think this requires a thoughtful and inclusive approach. Uh, we need to understand the local context and the needs. We must involve the communities. We must uh, create training materials for language localization in the local languages and also consider launching offline uh, engagements, workshops, and campaigns within the communities. And digital literacy training, for example, in Africa is also very fundamental. If communities are going to participate and adopt these ideas, they need to be digitally literate. So we must really develop these partnerships and collaborations very carefully and uh, address issues of uh, access to internet, access to devices in underserved communities, uh, provide actually subsidized internet access and encourage communities to participate by sharing their stories and also creating incentives for communities who are actually involved in getting others online and also involved in uh, ensuring the adoption of the internationalized domain names. And uh, lastly, I think uh, we need to have very good feedback mechanisms uh, impact assessment strategies so that we can understand the challenges, the concerns, and also how well we are doing in, in uh, this endeavor towards the adoption of internationalized domain names. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nodumo. Some very insightful mm -hmm. points, and I think it's a uh, ties in a lot to what I think this session will be going towards, which is thinking about a movement or an action plan amongst us, and how do we start? And I think Nodumo mentioned a few things, like you know, thinking about um, addressing the issue holistically, and, but at the same time, being able to reach the grassroots, um, each of us then can play a part, because we are part of a, a community locally. So I thought to seed those couple of thoughts first, and um, let's go into the next segment for this session, which is, uh, do we have any questions uh, for the speakers or any comments or thoughts about what we have dis discussed so far? Please, over to the mic. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Elisa Hever, and I'm uh, from the Dutch government, uh, from the Ministry of Economic Affairs, um, and a MAG member. Um, so, universal acceptance or IDNs is not is not something new. It's been there for um, for quite some time, um, and um, well, I've been in this field for three years, so slightly longer than that we know about IDNs, um, and I've been hearing actually from basically day one, uh, IDNs is an important topic. It's a very important topic. It's important. We need this. It's important. It's highly important. We really need this. And 
it doesn't seem that there's there's really really a big change happening up until now at least i i do feel that we're getting somewhere um even though there there have been resolutions already in the itu on this for for quite some time um and i'm wondering um how you really how you really think that we as governments also should act um, on ensuring or, or creating more, um, or, well, no, how should I say this? Sorry, I'm, I'm slightly tired after a week of IGF. Um, so what, what government, what role you see for governments in this process? Um, and um, which role you see for the technical, no, sorry, for the business community? Um, because I'm seeing ICANN here, and, and they are well, more from the technical community, and, and also the example given about Google uh, or Gmail and not really being um, um, instrumental in this. Um, I, I, I wonder which role you see for that uh, sector. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think there are two parts to your question, so I will try to dissect it for the speakers. Uh, I heard Marielza was going to leave early. Is she still on? <coughs> She's left? Because yes. uh, uh, I think one part of the question was, you know, how can governments help in terms of the policy aspect? Marielza would be very good to address that. Um, if that's the case, uh, can I first ask Edmund, then uh, Teresa? The question is how much time we have, right? <laughs> we can talk about this for hours. Um, you talk about three years, actually I've been working on this for 25 years and um, it's, it is improving. Um, so what I would like to say a few things. First, um, why, we, why is it important, why is it not, not, not done? Um, yes, it's, uh, it's also because of the technical uh, uh, and the policy requirements. So we're still working th through the technology and the policies to, to, to make it work. Um, we are very close to completing that, as uh, Teresa will, I'm sure, sure add. Um, so now is the time, is, is really uh, in, in, in my view. Um, and I think there is also the, cons the, the issue of um, the suppliers uh, that provide uh, IDN registrations, for example, is not seeing the, the demand. Um, and that is a, a problem. Um, they, the, and, and why didn't they see the demand? Well, one of the reasons is because the universal acceptance is not ready yet, because uh, emails are having so still, still different pr platforms are still not uh, uh, supporting it. Uh, web hosting uh, remains a problem. Um, so that is why we need policy intervention. That's why we need to break this uh, uh, chicken and egg issue. Um, so what governments should do, I, I think um, uh, governments should look at ICANN. Uh, what ICANN did was uh, a few years ago, and that, I, in my view, was a significant change. ICANN, for the first um, 20 years, have been you know, supporting, but not really you know, uh, doing it themselves. But since, I think it was 2015, around that time, um, ICANN had a, a universal acceptance program, and it's you know, starting to look at its own internal systems and make it ready. Uh, and that was a big thing. I think the next step needs to be registries and registrars need to be completely uh, universal acceptance ready. And you know, if I can you know, wave a wand and the GNSO would do everything, I would ask for you know, uh, registries and registrars to be, uh, to requ be required to be uh, universal acceptance ready, me being one of the registries as well. And I know it's very difficult. It, it's actually difficult because it is a bit of a long tail. There, the reason why it's difficult is because some of the systems that use, every part of the system you use touches on domain names and email addresses. And therefore, the actual change is small, but the long tail thing is, is you know, the long tail is pretty long. So governments, Look to the ICANN, the, uh, uh, the tendering process. All the, the IT systems that governments use, maybe you can't ask for them to be completely universal acceptance ready, but what you can ask for is a roadmap, right? You can ask for in your tenders is to ask the question, are you universal acceptance ready? Uh, if not, what is the plan to become universal acceptance ready? I mean, that's the one big thing. Second big thing, I think, uh, which I mentioned earlier as well, is about the education side. Um, 
you know, the curriculum needs to be updated. Uh, when, when, when students are taught networking 101, uh, internationalized domain names and email addresses should be the basic uh, uh, protocol, not um, an add-on. So I think, you know, at least those are two immediate things. And of course, the, uh, uh, the government systems themselves to become universal acceptance ready. Hopefully that's useful. I think Edmund really identified some really core actions we'd seen uh, with government contracts uh, in relation to IPv6 that had been successful, or at least created awareness around it uh, and encouraged businesses from that standpoint. I think um, on the local community side and the education side, encouraging the generation of local content uh, and awareness that the one could actually do local content then. Uh, so I think there's quite a bit there through uh, both the economic and the social areas uh, within the governments. Uh, and then, um, you know, also with activities in some of the partner organizations, you know, we heard uh, from UNESCO and others around uh, the need for this and the value of that. I think that we often hear at the national level um, the preservation of culture or the preservation of languages, linking that to the digital world and the opportunities that are there uh, from a government standpoint. I think from a business standpoint as well, um, you know, there's always the argument of is there the demand? Um, well, if one's not providing it, one doesn't know if there's a demand. And there might be ways that to create consumer awareness to know to ask for it uh, and to know to say, I would like to actually be able to have this resolve in that right way because one can create the mechanism, the technology for it, and as Edmund said, we're still developing some of the policies and, and ironing out some of the different areas in the trainings. Uh, but there's, um, there's, there's the overarching awareness that one actually can have something in one's own language, just like one can have uh, the ask for clean air or clean water. Um, it's not a utility from that standpoint, but it is something that is um, near and dear to every single individual uh, in how they communicate with each other. So I think some of those angles. Thank you. We have more questions or comments from the floor. Let's go to the next gentleman. Thank you. Hi, my name is Keisuke Kamimura, a professor of linguistics and Japanese at Daito Bunka University in Tokyo. And I attended a workshop on artificial intelligence this morning, and one of the speakers mentioned that uh, uh, artificial intelligence needs large chunk of language-based data. Uh, otherwise, um, AI does not learn uh, by themselves. So, um, Language-based data for lesser used languages or minority language, languages should be available before uh, making uh, artificial intelligence uh, becoming meaningful for them. Uh, is this kind of issue uh, related to this panel or is it going to be dealt with somewhere else or some, 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 somebody else? Any thoughts? Well, I think, I think it's very relevant, actually, when one of the things that I, I mentioned is that uh, today, uh, on the web, 57% of the content is still in English. So uh, even for general AI, um, you know, it is uh, um, English dominant. Uh, so the machine would have learned that English is, is the dominant language as well. So I think it is a matter that, um, that, that, that 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 is important to to address, although um, I'm certainly not, not not an expert on that. But I do know that um, you know, given that we 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 know that there is a bias with the the AI, and that part um, I do participate in the tri the IEEE uh, uh, working group on algorithmic bias. But um, back to the the topic here, I guess uh, the relevance I believe is that. Um, uh, internationalized domain names and email addresses can spark the uh, creation of content and, and services uh, in in the uh, in the different languages, whether it's indigenous languages or, or, or uh, different languages. And the reason why I, I like to use this uh, this uh, remind people of one interesting fact of the internet development: the DNS, the domain name system, was created in 1983. Uh, six years later. The web was invented in 1989. The 
basic infrastructure needs to be there. The basic foundations of the domain name and email addressing system needs to be there for the content layer to, to flourish. And I think this is, uh, this is going to be true for, for IDNs as well. Thank you. Can I do a quick segue? I know there is a queue, but I think I'll do a quick segue to Mark. Because when we were preparing for the session, um, we, we talked about working with open source community on standards and guidelines. I think ties in back to the question from the uh, professor about you know, um, availability of data in terms of languages. So I thought, Mark, maybe we can segue a quick one to you about you know, uh, in terms of relevance for AI on the one hand, but really working with the open source community, is there anything we can do uh, to uh, get this topic and going to raise awareness and to get people to adopt? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's very interesting hearing a lot of this discussion and I'm really resonating with a lot of what um, the other um, panel speakers are saying, Teresa and Edmund and, um, and Nodomo. And uh, uh, one thing I'd like to note is that the Unicode Consortium, which kind of works at a slightly different level to ICANN, um, the Unicode Consortium has launched uh, the digitally disadvantaged sorry, Digitally Disadvantaged Languages Subcommittee, and that's a mouthful, but the DDL subcommittee um, has just been launched and it's a real opportunity for us to engage with uh, industry partners because the Unico Consortium is a consortium of major industry vendors um, working in internationalization. And so there's a real uh, awareness right now coming out of the international decade of indigenous languages. So let's make sure that we are um, engaging at that level there. And, and, and that correlates with the perception in, in my part of the tech space that ICANN is very low level. You sort of deal with all of these nuts and bolts at a level where, you know, normal software developers don't need to think about it. And so I think for that reason, for many software developers, universal acceptance and IDN, it's not even on their radar just because it's like, oh, it's all low level stuff. Somebody else has already dealt with it. So I think some some level of promotion um, in a in an accessible space is kind of thing that the W3C has done very well um, with a lot of their um, standards for the for the web. But doing some of that kind of thing with clear accessible FAQs around uh, UA and what needs to be done and the gaps is a really good starting spot because I know, I've been doing this for a while but I haven't actually found a a one-stop shop where I can point people to, um, which is accessible. There's lots of very detailed documentation, but nothing that really says, well, this is the problem. Here's the, your normal questions. So in terms of engaging with the open source community, that's a really good starting spot. I'd be really good. I, I remember in the uh, UA report from 2022 that there was a big list of uh, major pro products and their level of support. Um, it'd be good to do the same sort of thing with some of the other, um, low level libraries that really power the internet, things like curl and OpenSSL, Node and PHP and even WordPress and just have a look at how well do these uh, products support universal acceptance and where are their gaps. And even then going through to the other end of, of the space, looking at end user software, things like Firefox and Thunderbird. And these are places where we have the opportunity to make improvements and submit changes to the to those communities and, and support them without needing to uh, wait for commercial priorities necessarily. And that often then drives the commercial vendors to go, oh, we need to actually match that functionality. So it's, it's just another prong in, in the strategy. Thank you, Mark. So, yep. Appreciate that. Okay, we have a queue, so let's try to move. Uh, so let's go to the next gentleman, okay. please. Uh, my name is Yudo, for the record. Uh, I'm from Indonesia, uh, serve as a board member, one of the board member of .id registry Pandi, and also working as a professor at Faculty of Computer Science, Universitas Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia, uh, I'm coming from a country with more than 700 languages. Uh, out of those 700 languages, we have identified more than 30 of them actually use a non-Latin script. Uh, one of the uh, one of the language that 
spoken by many uh, people in Indonesia is actually Japanese language spoken by 60 million people in Indonesia and we also have Balinese language everyone knows Bali and the, uh, the, the language is spoken by more than three uh, million people uh, in Indonesia mostly in Bali so uh, three years ago we submit an IDN application international domain name to ICANN and the motive or the background of it is simply to serve the underserved community, uh, to preserve the indigenous uh, language, and also to give universal access to them. Unfortunately, it was rejected by ICANN. Uh, as Teresa mentioned, there are several requirements, technical and also uh, political. Now, in, I mentioned two of the political requirements mentioned in the document. Number one is that the panel, you know, that I can simply just give it to the expert panel and then they will review the application. They mentioned that the Japanese language is written today only in Latin-based characters except for scholarly, historical, and decorative uh, purposes. And then there, is, uh, there are also requirements that mention that the language must be used as an official communication of the relevant public authority and also serve as a language of administration. So if you look at those two requirements, it's like chicken and egg. I mean, if the language is actually served as the administration, uh, language of administration as used by the public authority and company use, then it is actually not an underserved community in my, in my point of view. So uh, we think that by providing the IDN in for Japanese Balinese, then the people will have a uh, uh, when will have an, a room to play digitally. Because for non-digital world, I think UNESCO and my government and also Dutch government, if you mention University of Leiden, actually uh, has done lots of work for our manuscript. So. Uh, to make us happy, we are actually currently uh, intensively communicate with ICANN, with Professor Sarmat and also Pitinan to develop the label generation rule for the Japanese, Balinese, and Pagan. But with those two requirements, because in Indonesia actually since 1928, we have an oath that we will use Bahasa Indonesia as the national language, but we still have those more than 700 uh, uh, indigenous language. So we are not like India, who actually they put most of the languages in their constitution. So uh, it, we just actually support very much when, when India has actually applied for the IDN. So uh, as long as we still have the requirements, I don't think ICANN is actually very serious in the inclusivity, underserved community, uh, for the people who actually they don't speak English or they don't use common language like Japanese, Korean, and also Chinese. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to Teresa to address it, because we only have three minutes, let's not leave anyone behind. Let's go for the question from on uh, remote as well. Then let's try to use the remaining time to wrap up. Yeah. So this is a question from Amit Paria. How would the private sector be motivated to develop tech with language inclusivity as their priority? Okay, this one uh, would Mark or Emma want to take it? Hold on first, then we'll get the lady over there, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panel. Um, first of all, um, congratulations to anybody who is working tirelessly to improve access to languages digitally, both AI and automated speech recognition. But at the same time, a plea. My name is Lydia Best, and I am from the European Federation of Hard of Hearing People. And many of us rely on sometimes auto caption, you know, services. And the plea is, can you please make sure that we actually don't get sensors? Because often auto captioning sensors language. What hearing people can hear, we don't, especially swear words. We also want to know if somebody was swearing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have two minutes, maybe one minute for Teresa uh, to you those question, and then maybe uh, Emin can do a quick one for the remote participant. Thank you. Yes, and, and we can um, also follow up uh, offline on this. 
Um, but my understanding is that, uh, I was just checking with a colleague, uh, that we are working with the Javanese community to develop uh, the LGR, and I, I believe you're, you're part of all of that work, and that one of the areas is that the Unicode, Unicode categorizes the Javanese as a limited use language, but we've also requested to start working with a Unicode listed as a re recommended script identifier. So hopefully that work will continue uh, to bring progress to this issue, of course, uh, and that will also help us with the uh, process for new applications. So um, re rest assured, wor work is underway as we're trying to resolve the different areas, and, and we look forward to your continuing efforts on that, on that. So thank you. I guess I will quickly add to that as well. Um, we'll very much encourage you to bring this up again at the ICANN Public Forum in Hamburg. Um, but two things quickly. The uh, IDN CCPDP, the, the, pub, uh, the policy development process is actually ongo uh, still ongoing and is addressing some of the, the issues that you're saying. The second thing is maybe we should ask ICANN to revisit the um, label generation uh, uh, process in light of the international decade of indigenous language. And if we embrace that, that would work well. In response to the question on the private sector incentive, I think we're looking at an issue of market failure, and therefore just uh, relying on market forces is not going to work, uh, especially when you're talking about indigenous languages and you know, uh, uh, supporting universal acceptance that have a very long tail. So in that sense, then, you know, it really requires policy intervention, uh, and it's either motivation, as in you know, giving you money to, to actually get it done, or the other way is a kind of quote-unquote penalty or requirement, uh, which is what what I mentioned earlier, requirement in tenders, um, you know, so, so I think uh, those types of uh, policy intervention would be, uh, would be useful. Thank you. All right, we've run out of time, but this has been very engaging in terms of the discussion and uh, very insightful comments from uh, our speakers on the panel. And uh, to wrap up, I'd like to ask everyone just to give it a think in terms of uh, inclusion in, uh, for a multilingual internet. Let's say if you, know, if you are uh, more of a technical person like Mark, uh, if you come across a website that doesn't ac accept domain names or emails in other scripts, uh, what can we do to raise awareness about it, to let the software developer or the company know that they should fix it? Uh, this will help to generate uh, awareness. And also, let's say you, know, you are from a academic institution, we have professors here, students here, also Nodumo who shared, uh, you know, how can we include in the curriculum for our students to know about this space so that we can be more inclusive? Uh, even for end users, uh, you know, uh, are there websites or software that you use day to day? And have you thought whether they can accept domain names or emails in other scripts? Let's think about it, and perhaps the next time we come back, uh, we can share some progress uh, instead of just saying that it's very important, very important, but perhaps next year when we come back, we can actually share some progress we've made together, one step at a time. So with that, we'll close for today's session. Thank you so much for participating, and help me thank my speakers. Thank you.